Good evening. On behalf of Lewis Academy Now and the Thomas Jefferson Alumni Action Group, or TJAG, thank you for joining us and welcome to the See It, Be It speaker series. I'm Esther Berg, and I'm proud to introduce and present Lewis Academy Now and TJAG um, presenting this programming together as two organizations striving towards equity in education here in Fairfax County and beyond. TJAG is a group of more than 1,000 TJ alumni that seek to enhance accessibility, inclusion, and innovation within STEM education in order to develop well-rounded and ethical 21st century leaders. Lewis Academy now represents hundreds of community members, parents, and students, and is an independent organization formed to bring an Academy for Public Policy government and human rights to Fairfax County's John R. Lewis High School. Academies in Fairfax County Public High Schools offer specialized courses that combine academic and career preparation. The Lewis Academy would be an apolitical program designed to encourage civic engagement and develop student awareness of the processes of change through various forms of federal, state, and local government. But enough about us, let's meet Delegate Tran. Tonight's conversation is available in English and Spanish. To hear the Spanish interpreter, look for the globe icon along your bottom menu and select your preferred language. We'll be recording tonight's discussion and though your fellow audience members won't be visible, your questions will be recorded as well. And maybe your six-year-old son will too. <laughs> in addition, you'll want, I know it's a cicada wing, thank you. You'll want to have a smartphone or similar device handy towards the end so you can join in the game of Kahoot, which will be explained later. So without further ado, please welcome TJAG's Caitlin Swanner, our co-sponsor. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Esther. I'm so excited that we have Delegate Kathy Tran with us here tonight. Delegate Tran represents Virginia's 42nd district, and she was one of the first Asian American women elected to the Virginia House of Delegates. So welcome, Delegate Tran. Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us tonight. I, I wanted to start off just by asking if you could tell Hi. us a little bit more about your childhood and how you grew up. Absolutely. Um, well, right now, first of all, I have to introduce my special guest. This is Elise, who is four, and so she might stay with me for a portion of tonight's conversation. Um, but I came to this country as a boat refugee when I was a toddler from Vietnam. So uh, when after the Vietnam War, my dad was had served as a dentist in the army, and he went to re-education prison. And when he came out from there, my parents just really felt that they didn't have a future in Vietnam. And we left the country by boat. I was six and a half months old and we were at sea for several days and my parents, um, you know, were just, uh, it, was, it was a very um, harrowing trip. My mother remembers the night she left that it was so dark, she couldn't see where the sky and the ocean met um, that evening. And we were at a refugee camp in Malaysia for 13 months. That was a pretty long time to be in a refugee camp in the early, you know, the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but my parents wanted to come to America because they felt this country was a place that represented hope and opportunity and freedom. And so we waited those 13 months for the US to accept our application. And I was resettled in Southern California. Uh, by an agency called the International Rescue Committee. And I came here when I was almost two years old and I grew up in outside of Los Angeles and then in San Diego um, before I went to college. And my parents, um, when we first came, they worked in low wage and minimum wage jobs. Um, they took, my mom took a bus to get to work. It took, uh, you know, over and, you know, took a, over an hour um, each way to get to her job. And my dad for a while had a really hard time finding a job. Um, I said he was a practicing dentist. So he thought he was gonna be a dental technician here. And um, 
there were many folks who felt that he didn't have the right English skills or he didn't, he was overqualified for the job. And so when uh, he was hired by Mr. Sam, um, my parents were really overjoyed because uh, somebody took a chance on my dad. And Mr. Sam thought my dad is somebody who could, you know, who had the skills, who could help mentor other employees and paid my dad $3.35 in the early 80s, uh, which was minimum wage at the time. My mom still has his first pay stub. Um, so we grew up for a long time in a one bedroom apartment before my parents were able to afford a house. And then my dad um, started a small business as his own dental lab. And then he, uh, when I was in high school, went back and was able to get his dental license. And so those kind of experiences with my parents in terms of starting over, learning a new language, a new culture, um, having my parents mm -hmm. you know, work in uh, low wage jobs and then restart their careers have really just shaped my perspective, um, both as a mom and as a policymaker. It's such an incredible story, thank you. And I, I'm curious, you know, you were pretty young um, when you first came to the United States, but obviously you're very familiar with the challenges your parents were thinking, but I'm curious what you remember from that time and when you were in elementary school, you know, if you just felt like uh, every other American kid or if you felt like there were different challenges you had to navigate. You know, I remember a lot of, um, you have, hold on one second. Um, you know, you know how like as a kid, you just have some very distinct memories. And I, I mean, I very clearly remember going to the grocery store with my mother and asking her to buy a fruit roll up. So that totally dates me as an eighties kid, right? But a fruit roll up is like, it's like fruit by the foot now, right? But it was like a yeah. big sheet and you like unrolled it. It was 99 cents. And I remember my mom telling me it was too expensive. She would get it occasionally, but not every single trip because 99 cents was a lot of money for my parents. I remember that. Um, I remember also, you know, and this has come up a lot with the rise in, in hate and violence against the API community. Um, just remember the school lunches my mom would make, um, particularly if we had a school field trip and I brought, you know, a cold egg sandwich with fish sauce, right? So you can imagine, <laughs> You can imagine what that was like at lunchtime. Yeah. Um, and, and my mom, like, we didn't have juice boxes and things like that. So she would pack um, the only soda she knew, which was a can of coconut soda. And so I had a very different lunch for those field trips. And I, I remember what that felt like um, to have that. And the other thing I remember a lot is my parents, my dad worked and he has, um, you know, he was not fluent in English. He was not comfortable. And so my mom, who was fluent in English, but she was the one who had to take a bus, um, you know, over an hour to get to work. So she could never make parent-teacher conferences. And, but so she had to ask my teachers to please, you know, uh, um, let her like have a phone, com a phone conference um, to better understand mm -hmm. my progress in school. And so she had to do that during her lunch break because she wasn't just able to take time off from, from work. Right. Um, yeah. I remember, you know, struggles with health insurance, um, conversations about how to, how to, when to go to the doctor and what doctor we could go to. And so I remember all of those very, like very distinctly. And it's conversations I continue to have with my own children about sometimes the privilege that we have now, um, and the things that we're able to do now that is very different from my <laughs> childhood. So when you were a kid, what did you think you would be when you grew up? You know, what did you think you'd be a dentist like, like your dad? Or did you think you'd take a different path? Um, I was afraid of the dentist. I still am. <laughs> um, my dad makes fun of me for that because now I'm, I'm the one who takes our kids to the dentist. He's like, <laughs> what comes around? Comes around. But um, I remember the first thing I wanted to be, this was like third or fourth grade, was to be a marine biologist. Um, and I was just really fascinated awesome. with animals and but I went through a period where I wanted to be a lawyer um, and even through parts of college wanting to be a lawyer as well um, but I think in college I realized that probably wasn't the path for me and everybody else was looking at like investment banking or management consulting um, and I just realized that wasn't for me either and really 
um, really did my college internships and such in the nonprofit sector, working with immigrant communities and refugee communities, um, feeling like that's you know always been kind of a um, issue wise a first love for me because it's been so personal. Um, but but working with uh, organizations that were directly serving um, people in need. Yeah, that's wonderful. I actually had a marine biology phase myself. That's what I thought I wanted to be in um, in middle school. And but so I know um, you went off to college. You went to Duke, go Blue Devils. I'm a fellow Duke alum. Um, but yeah, so it sounded like lawyer wasn't the right choice. But what did you end up studying while you were in college? I didn't know you were a, a Blue Devil too. That's exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> in college, I studied history uh, with a focus on women's history. And I, I do just want to note kind of all the conversations right now about um, learning American history and all the different aspects of American history. I'm just so sorry. Just realized that uh, Lisa's making faces at everybody. Um, I think the first time I seriously studied Asian American history was in college in a class I took, like a survey class on women's history. And uh, my, um, we had a grad student who was our teacher uh, and she had us read Unbound Feet. And that, you know, it took a really long time for me to learn a really important aspect of American history. Um, and I do hope that as we in Virginia take a look overall at what our K through 12 curriculum ought to be, that we have a much more inclusive and representative discussion around American history. Um, but I was a history major. After college, I went and got a master's in social work, in community organizing. So not uh, clinical social work, what, which is what many people think about when they think about social workers. Um, but I was really, really, it was, it appealed to me for a couple of different reasons. Um, I'll be honest, for all my high school friends who are looking at test taking, uh, the program I applied to did not require the graduate uh, school exam. And so that was a huge plus for me. And it also just really appealed to me a sense of looking and studying issues and um, through a lens of social justice and equity and making sure that we were centering and putting people in you know in communities in the in the middle of our um of ideas and solutions okay. Why? all right sorry no that's wonderful and so were you able to go to graduate school right out of college or were you working for you a few years first i took a year um out after undergrad uh, before I started, before I went to grad school, and I worked um, out in the Bay Area with a group called City Year. So City Year is it's an AmeriCorps program, and it helps provide tutoring and other um, supports for schools and after-school programs. Um, so I was in the set was in San Jose, um, kind of in the South Bay Area, and was out there for a year doing that. And so I managed. I wasn't in AmeriCorps, but I managed a team of AmeriCorps volunteers. Um, in, uh, who are working in like Title I schools, um, working per, in mainly community uh, schools that served immigrants um, in the San Jose, kind of downtown San Jose area, and just had a wonderful time. And so it was then that I uh, started my application process and went to uh, grad school the next year. So after grad school, I know you eventually ended up at the Department of Labor. Was that um, right after grad school or did you have some other work in between? Yeah, it was right after grad school. I went to, um, I got a presidential management fellowship, which are these, like, it's a leadership development program for people coming out of grad school to go work in our federal government. And I uh, got a job with the U.S. Department of Labor. I thought I would come to D.C. for two years and then go do something else. Um, and I stayed at labor for 12 years. Um, and I realized then that I am very motivated by mission, right? And so the mission of the U.S. Department of Labor is to help make, you know, to help American workers find good jobs and have jobs that are safe, right, with good benefits. And to help employers, you know, connect to the workers and um, have their workplaces be safe and help them with their benefits too that they're giving to workers. And so that was really appealing to me. And I thought a lot about my dad actually, um, because 
here was somebody who, you know, had this professional training in another country. And just because he came here to start anew, he wasn't able to do that. My dad didn't get his dental license again for 14 years after we came here, um, wow. which is a really long time. And so I thought about the struggles that my dad and my mom went through and how I wanted to make sure that I was putting, um, that I was helping with policies and programs that helped people get good jobs. Because we all know that, you know, sometimes our job is not just about how we put food on the table and where we spend so much of our time, but it's such a, sometimes an important part of our identities. And, um, and I thought that was really important. And so that's why, um, that's why I was really, really grateful and gratified by the work I did at the U.S. Department of Labor. Yeah, that's wonderful. And it sounds like you've always been, you know, you've always been really interested in public service and, and, and giving back and working with people. But so what inspired you to run for office, elected official? Yeah, so um, I never thought I would ever run for office. Um, I, it was like, other people do that. Um, but I was pregnant with Elise, who was sitting here making faces at y'all. Um, yeah. But I was pregnant with Elise in, in 2016. And the outcomes of that presidential election were, you know, just really deeply concerning to me and my family. And I was due with Elise on inauguration day. So I just felt like lots of things were topsy-turvy, right? And um, we gave her her name, which is Elise Minkun. And Elise was inspired by Ellis Island. So my husband has family that passed through Ellis Island as they were escaping anti-Semitism at the turn of the century. And Minkun is Vietnamese for Bright Bell. And that was inspired by the Liberty Bell. So to us, her name means to ring the bells of liberty and champion opportunity for all. And I made the decision to run for office when she was a month old because I realized I couldn't sit on the sidelines. You know, that, that moment was the time I needed to stand up and speak out and really do everything I could for all my kids' futures. Um, and that's why I jumped into this, this whole political sphere <laughs> and, became, became, uh, and ran for office. And so that's what happened. Yeah, that's great. I think, uh, you know, I was so excited when you got elected and it's been so wonderful to see um, different faces in politics. And I think, you know, I'm someone who, uh, like the kids at John Lewis, you know, grew up outside of the DC area, but I still always felt very much like DC politics was very much for, you know, old white men. It wasn't a place where I ever saw myself. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about you know, you, you said you never also thought that you would run for office. So how did you kind of like get over that? And how did you figure out what you needed to do to actually run for office? So I, um, there are lots of different training programs that help candidates now. Some of these programs have been around for, for like ever, right? But other programs really sprang up in 2017. Um, so really uh, kind of came about after the presidential election. And there are programs to help you based on your political party. There are programs to help you based on, you know, if you are an, a, a person of color or an immigrant, um, if you are um, LGBTQ candidate or identify as, you know, a female or male, like there, if you're a veteran, um, all different types of programs. Many of these programs are actually low cost or no cost, they're free. And they help kind of dispel the myth of what it takes to run a campaign. And so I was a part of Emerge Virginia. They ran a boot camp. I took Elise, who was a month old, to that camp, and we sat there all weekend. I remember she turned a month, exactly a month old that Saturday, and I did the training. And so, and I remember afterwards, um, the then executive director was like, you know, when you called to tell us if you could, you know, to say, hey, I'm going to bring this baby. Is that okay? We were like, oh, I don't know how this is going to, like, how are you going to do this? But it worked out. And so I use I, I share that as an example of, of don't let any anybody or any situation really stop you and be a barrier. And I think um, just have to have the the village to support you, whether that's your immediate family or some friends or neighbors or some combination of that, and just go out and do it, right? There's never a perfect time. There's never a perfect time to you know, go back to school. There's never a perfect time to change jobs or, you know, sometimes have a kid or whatever, right? So just do it if that's what is inspires you and what motivates you to get out of bed and what's going to make you excited um, is to, to, to just, just do it. Don't wait for anybody to ask you because most likely they're not going to ask, nobody's going to ask people who look like us, right? Um, so that's what I would say. And there are lots of folks who are younger 
who are jumping up and running for office because um, you know, y'all have really important perspectives and ex life experiences to share. Thank you for that. And I think also, you know, you've had a lot of experiences that might not necessarily be obviously good preparation for political work, but I imagine you could probably draw on some of those experiences, you know, your experience as a PTA president, your experience working in the federal government, um, your academic experience. You can talk, can you talk a little bit more about what was most helpful for you that you, or some experience you found you're like, oh, this actually really prepared me well for this. I think um, the experience that I, so I, I really love the, I love two things about my job. I love the constituent work uh, where I feel like that's work where people call and they say, I need help with this very specific thing. And sometimes I can help solve that issue, right? And sometimes I can't, and I have to change the law to do so, or like, there's just no way we can, we can fix it. But what I can do is listen. And I can try to figure out what the next steps are to help somebody. And I think that a lot of that preparation came from being in my social work program. Even though I wasn't a clinical social worker, right? Like somebody you might have an, an, as a school social worker or somebody you might go see, or a, like a case worker, I did have to take classes where it was really about how do we listen and problem solve to help somebody. Um, the other part of the job that I really like is all the policy work. Like reading legislation, sometimes it's like a you know entirely different language, the way like the law is written than the way you and I might talk about a law, right? So reading legislation and trying to figure out if I wanna make this change in our laws, what does the bill actually have to say to achieve that? Right. And sometimes the work we do, there's, I would say this, rarely is a law or a bill ever perfect. And that's because everybody who's voting believes that we all have the best idea on how to address the, the situation. So if, if my idea, if I think my idea is right, and you think your idea is right, then we're going to have to compromise somehow, right? If I'm going to try to get you to vote for something. And so that work in like understanding policy and understanding legislation and how do you reach those negotiations? How do you have those negotiations? What are all the different options? How do you come up with the best one? I think a lot of that preparation came from my work at the Department of Labor. Um, what, while during the time, time I was there for 12 years, I was the director of um, my agency, the Department of Labor has 16 different little agencies. So I was the director of my agency's office uh, or division for policy legislation and regulations. So I had to do a lot of thinking about policy, right? And analysis of policy. So I think that that experience helped me, is helping me now in that work. Wonderful. And you mentioned listening. And I think one of the things I really appreciate about you as, elected, as an elected official is I know um, you are really interested in listening to your constituents and seeing how you can help them. And I think one way you've demonstrated that is as a founding member of the Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus. And I know um, you all have been hosting listening sessions and really uh, taking the time to talk to people in the community. And so I was just curious, um, you know, for me, again, even though I grew up so close to, you know, the political center of the country, it's it took me a long time to realize that, our, you know, our elected officials really are there for us. <laughs> and so I'm curious for a high school student, you know, what kind of engagement would you be looking for them or what recommendations would you give to them about, um, you know, maybe when to reach out to their elected officials or how to engage with their elected officials generally? Um, so I actually think, I mean, on a couple of different ways, What's really interesting, because like when you often think about somebody who's elected, you think about like Congress, right? You're, so you're co congressman or congresswoman and you're a US senator and they're like, oh my gosh, right? They're like amazing, these folks, right? And they're, but, um, but because they represent such large areas and then our senators represent the whole state, um, it seems like they're a little bit harder to reach in that sense. Although their, their staff are wonderful and they themselves are. Virginia is really lucky. We're really lucky in Virginia. But um, your state delegation, right, your state delegate here in Virginia, your state senator, I feel like we, um, I just feel like we're in the, and around the community a lot. So there are a lot of different, and we're super accessible. So there are lots of different ways to connect. If you're interested, if you have an issue that you're really passionate about, and you want to talk to your delegate or talk to your state senator, you should reach out and ask for an appointment. And so we actually have lots of these appointments ourselves. And particularly when we're not in session and um, session is just like a whole other 
crazy time, but if we're not in session, like I meet with constituents all the time. I've been having Zoom meetings with them. I have a lot of uh, town halls. So you can always see if your, uh, rep your state representative has a town hall that you can go and listen, see what they're about, ask your questions or schedule a time to sit by yourself um, and meet one-on-one -on -one with them. The other thing is you could all, we're always looking for interns in my office, as well as all, all my colleagues. So if you want to volunteer and kind of get to know the nitty gritty, reach out to ask for an internship. It could be during the summer. Um, it could also be during just a short period of time in session where it's really like intense. Um, so you'll get like a four to six week intensive or six to eight weeks of intensive experience during session. Reach out and do that. Then the other piece is if you're really interested in kind of electoral politics, which is the campaign side, um, it's an election year. So you should be reaching out uh, to your candidate and asking if they need volunteers um, during an election year. And I think that's a way to really get engaged and get to understand the ins and outs of a campaign and to network and meet people. Um, and it also gives you a chance to get to know the community as you are talking to constituents in the community about what they're really interested and passionate about. So lots of different ways to get involved. And don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's a, a yeah. bunch of different resources that people can look into if they're interested in getting more civically engaged or more engaged in politics or just learning more about the issues in their community. Um, and then I also just wanted to go back to, of course, so now you've been a delegate for four years. And uh, I'm curious what uh, you've passed 29 bills on a bunch of other <laughs> issues. And um, I'm wondering what you're most proud of from your time in office so far. Mm. Um, there, there are a couple of things that I am really proud of. I think overall, let me start up overall, what I think one of the most consequential votes that I've taken was when we passed Medicaid expansion. So we, what we did when we passed Medicaid expansions was just to say, hey, if you make 139% above the poverty threshold, right, where you qualify, the threshold where you qualify for, for Medicaid, if you make 139% above that, then you can also qualify. So that just expanded who could apply and have healthcare coverage. Um, and so we thought we would have 400,000 people be eligible in Virginia. And these are some of our most poor families and vulnerable individuals in Virginia, right? People who are facing all sorts of medical situations who can't get treated. And what we learned just the other week is so far we've had 550,000 Virginians sign up. You just think about that. That means 550,000 people who before were literally trying to figure out if they could go see a doctor because they were sick or if they could get medication to treat their illness, that they now have access to healthcare. And that I think has been like, it's, it's just been incredible, particularly in this public health pandemic for people to have that coverage. Um, so I'm really, really proud of that. But I'm also really proud um, of the fact that we've expanded access to voting. So if you, you know, if you, if you back to my, my personal story, I mean, my parents literally risked our lives in order to come to a country where they could vote and actively participate and have a voice in their government. And for Virginia, we went from being ranked 49th in the country to being ranked 12th in terms of voter access. And that's incredible in terms of how we have made just going to the ballot box and putting in your one person, one vote, yeah. right? Your voice on a particular, for a particular candidate or a particular issue, make it easier for people. Um, so I'm really proud of that, particularly as we see across this country right now, so many states trying to suppress and squash people's ability to vote. Um, on a personal level, I've just, I mean, I've really spent a lot of time um, on healthcare. I had a bill that I introduced that passed um, to protect coverage for pre existing conditions. So, what we had in the code was if there were changes to the Affordable Care Act, then you could go back to selling insurance plans the way we used to do it. And now you can't anymore. And we know there are still lawsuits against the Affordable Care Act in the US Supreme Court. 
So if, if for any reason that bill is repealed or changed by the courts or by Congress, we will always cover pre-existing conditions. Um, so that's really important. And then I've had a bunch, uh, a series of bills around making sure that we better support our immigrant communities and refugees. Um, so I'm really proud of that. I had the bill to expand driving privileges to undocumented immigrants. And we know there are so many undocumented immigrants who are our friends, our neighbors, and sometimes our family members. And they were afraid to drive if they, you know, take their kids to school, go to church, go to the grocery store. And yes, go to work. <laughs> um, and so it's if you can pass all the DMV requirements, then you and a couple of other other things, then you can get a driver privilege card. And then um, we've had over 12,000 Virginians get a driver privilege card since January alone. And then this year, I had a bill to protect everybody's DMV uh, data, the data we share with the DMV when you go and get um, any type of credential. Um, so I'm really proud of those efforts. And then uh, my last bucket is just expanding um, rights and protections. And so I worked with a lot of constituents to help individuals with disabilities um, have more rights when they go to the hospital. Um, people were making the decision to keep their loved ones at home because they were afraid they were going to be separated in a hospital. And sometimes if their loved one had a disability that prevented them from communicating or conducting, you know, daily living activities like eating or toileting, then um, they were really afraid about the care that their loved one was going to get. So they were like staying home or just being on the phone with the doctor. Um, so we want to make sure that everybody who goes to the hospital, uh, all the people who have a disability, have a designated support person to help them with activities and be a voice for them. And then um, I also had a bill to expand anti-discrimination protections for our service members, our military spouses and their dependents. So many military spouses face uh, discrimination when they're trying to find a job, right? People are like, I don't know if you're gonna be around because you're in the, you know, your loved one, you know, you're married to somebody in the military, you might leave, so I'm not gonna hire you. And so in Virginia, we say, you can't do that anymore because that's not right. And then also um, there were a lot of landlords who are making our service members give up their federal housing protections um, under some a federal law in order to get a lease. And we're like, nobody should have to give up their federal rights uh, in order to get a place to stay in Virginia. And so we um, we said no to that too. So those are some things I'm really happy about. <laughs> yeah, a lot of exciting changes, definitely having a huge impact. We have one uh, live question that came in in the Q&A. Uh, what do you believe unites the AAPI community in the US? What ties together these more than 50 ethnicities and nationalities? Uh, that's an excellent question. It is. It was very much a, I think, like a political identity that was created um, several decades ago. But I think born from that it are some common experiences um, that we have. Um, you know, there's. it's not new to our community to be othered or scapegoated. I think so many in the AAPI community have been you know, asked multiple times, like, where are you from? Can't you just speak English? Like, you know, and assumptions made based on the way we look that we must be a foreigner um, and, uh, and sometimes uh, the accents that we might have and things like that. And so born kind of from that, I think is an understanding amongst many community members that we are stronger when we are united um, and speak and work together. And uh, Caitlin had mentioned we formed the AAPI caucus and we're all very, have very different backgrounds in the AAPI caucus. There's five um, state, legislat state legislators in Virginia who are um, Asian American and Pacific or Pacific Islander. And so, but we recognize that by kind of organizing and coordinating um, and creating a platform for us to work um, more closely together that we could help lift up some common uh, concerns in the community and help address them. And we also realized that the concerns in our community alone, um, there's a lot of similarities with maybe other communities as well in Virginia. So that's, they're not just API specific, right? Sometimes they are, but sometimes they do cross over. Language access is one of them. You know, making sure that small business uh, supports and relief is available to all small businesses um, is another, for example. So, yeah. 
Thank you. And I encourage any other audience members, if you have other questions you'd like us to answer live, feel free to put them in uh, mm -hmm. soon before we get to our lightning round and, and our Kahoot game. Um, but before we get into that, it's you know, it's incredible hearing your story, hearing the challenges you and your family had to overcome as a child. And then, you know, now you're here as state elected official, having a big impact across the state and expanding healthcare, expanding protections for people, expanding voter rights. So looking back now to your high school self, what would you tell your high school self now? <laughs> everything you've learned and experienced. I don't know why, I suddenly feel very emotional. Um, I was not a very cool high school student. I tell my, my kids that all the time when they're trying to figure out, my daughter who's 10 and reads all these um, middle, middle grade books, is that it, right? Middle grade books where I think sometimes the characters are probably more cool than we'll ever be. I say, I, we always tell her, I mean, just take a look at us, you know, you know it's, and it's okay. Um, my husband was the tubist in high school. He played the tuba, <laughs> um, which I guess is also very cool. But um, I think I would tell my high school self, like, just love yourself, you know? And I think, um, I don't know why I'm getting emotional. Love yourself, you are enough. Um, because I think particularly for immigrant kids and, you know, and I, I, I very much, um, very proud of and closely identify with being Vietnamese American, but sometimes you just kind of are like, you know, why can't we do things like that? Right. Like, why can't we eat a steak dinner more <laughs> every night? Like I eat Vietnamese food every night growing up and stuff like that. Um, and, and, and being proud of who you are and who your family, you know, um, your family and uh, the circles that you have and you don't have to keep up with anybody else but you and I think that's okay yeah it's a wonderful message thank you um yeah <laughs> sorry I think it makes me think we can't, I mean, honestly, I think a lot about my kids, you know, they're half Vietnamese, they're half Jewish. So we talk a lot about the issues facing both of our communities all the time and um, that they ought to just love themselves. And um, and, uh, and why that's so important, why that's so important. But also um, the other piece I would say is be aware and extend, you know, be an upstander. And try to always be an upstander. I haven't always been an upstander in my life, right? Um, and that, I thought an upstander was a word that my kids came home and made up from school that they learned in school, but it's a real term, which basically means to stand up for other people and don't be a bystander and um, be, an, be an ally and, and uh, reach out and lend a helping hand to the people who need it. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, from there, I think we can move into our lightning round, um, have a little fun. So I'm just going to read uh, a series of options to you, and you can pick the one you like the most. Okay, all right, I'm ready. All right, first one, car, bike, train, or bus? Car. Okay. Running, walking, swimming, or biking? Walking. <laughs> <laughs> um, vanilla, pistachio, chocolate, or strawberry? Pistachio. Um, beach, mountains, or somewhere in between? Oh, somewhere in between. Probably beach. Um, Washington Nationals or DC United? Oh, Nationals. I figured you'd <laughs> say that, but I wanted to throw in a shout out to DC United because I'm a big soccer fan. Um, we, are, we are big Nationals fans in this house. <laughs> yeah. Um, photography, painting, or music? Painting. Math, science, history, or literature? History. Okay. Um, podcasts, newspapers, or online news? Oh, um, newspapers. Well, I don't have time, so I'm, now I'm online news, but we still get the daily Washington Post in my house. I always got that growing up, yeah. Um, movies or TV shows? Movies. Okay, and last one, musicals or plays? Uh, probably musicals. All right. Uh, well, from there, we can move into our Kahoot game. So I will uh, get this running and then I'll share my screen. Everybody's going to meet more of my family. Everybody. 
Cái này bị nhập vào Bị nhập vào đây Nhập vào bị chuẩn bị phương tiện Oh look here's baby Warren <laughs> Alright let me share my screen here Okay so we've got the game pin on the screen here so um if everyone can get logged in then we can get started I'll try to put some of the join info in the chat all right we'll give a few people a few more minutes to log in see we've got three people logged on all right i'll give it just a few more seconds see if anyone else wants to join in All right, well, we will go ahead. Oh, there we go. We got one more. I'll give it just a few more seconds. All right, there we go. Let's go ahead and we'll get started. All right, first question. From which country did Delegate Tran and her family flee as refugees? All right, we got two people with the right answer. So we've got Lauren in first. Go to our next question. What graduate degree does Delegate Tran hold? All right, everybody got this one right. Master of Social Work. Okay, Lauren's still in first. Now to our next question, what area of policy and advocacy did Delegate Tran focus on early in her career? That was a little bit of a tricky question. But immigration. All right, hope moving up. All right, we got two more questions. So the next one, what district does Delegate Tran represent? Forty second. Looks like most people got it. All right. Hope, hope's on fire, highest answer streak, but Lauren's still holding in first. Well, here's our last question. How many bills has Selgatran passed since being elected in 2017? Two, one, and... All right, 29 bills and most people got it. So let's see who our winner is. Right, in third place, Mama B. In second place, we've got Hope. And in first place, goes to Lauren. All right. Very cool. Oh, let me see if I can turn the sound off of that now. <laughs> okay. Well, I will put um, an email address in the chat and uh, Lauren, you can send an email there and we will get you your prize. All right. Well, that is uh, most of our event this evening. And so Delegate Trin, I just wanna thank you again so much for joining us and just wanted to see if you have any 
um, last words or words of wisdom or advice or anything before we wrap up? <laughs> Um, I just I want to talk a little bit about the this moment now in our country, Caitlin, if that's okay. And I think what what we're at, I feel like we're at this crossroads, right? We've come out of this coming. We're coming. We're not out yet, but coming out of this pandemic, and we um, have seen the health you know health inequities um, during this time. We've also seen a lot of economic challenges. We see that in our own country, but we also see how it plays out across the world, right? And so grateful for the amount of vaccines that we have and the access we have here, but we know people in India and South Africa and so many other South America are really struggling. But we also see that in our own communities, um, the inequities in our own communities uh, around healthcare, around um, how our economic challenges have affected both communities of color and women, frankly, right? The, the labor system is... Mm -hmm. Um, the way it's set up currently. Um, we also have come from, uh, I think, a season of just trauma and then being galvanized by that, by what's going on with um, a resurgent, I think, Black Lives Matters movement and people also coming together uh, around stopping AAPI hate. And I think that this is a moment where we have a chance to rebuild in Virginia, kind of at the, with the status quo. And there were lots of families who kind of did okay, you know, with the way things were before the pandemic. But there were also millions of Virginians um, who really struggled and um, either with work, um, access, with healthcare, with all sorts of things. Um, and I think this is a chance to really center women and black and brown communities and immigrants uh, and other voices that haven't been at the table in our policy making. Um, and so I really hope that everybody who's on tonight gets involved, right? Whatever issue it is that you're passionate about that motivates you to get up that makes you get really excited um, whether it's the person or the issue or an organization that you get involved because I think now is that moment um, and we should all be feeling that calling towards creating a better, a better Virginia and a better country and a better future for each and every one of us. Um, and I, I think of a uh, <laughs> baby Warren who's a little bit grumpy right now, and I just wipe the boogers from his nose. But um, you know, he uh, his his name. Let me just tell you about him. I told you about Elise earlier. But Warren, um, Warren was named after Senator Elizabeth Warren, um, who's just a personal shero of uh, mine and my, my husband's, um, and she's just a justice warrior. And Bao Jiao is his middle name, and that means precious treasure in Vietnamese. So Warren's name to us means that justice is a precious treasure that we must stand up for. And I think that's what this moment right now is, is, uh, is what that's about. It's about justice and equity and building together and making sure that everybody is included and has a seat at the table. And in this really important conversation about the future of Virginia and the future of our country. And so I hope that, um, you know, I really appreciate y'all having me on tonight. I hope that everybody is just uh, gets uh, inspired to get in the game and to make sure that you um, are helping to, to do that work to shape to shape our future together so that it is more just and equitable. So thank you. Thank you so much for those beautiful words. And uh, we are recording this event, so we'll share the recording and we're looking forward to our high school students. I, I know I've been really inspired by your story and um, your journey. And so hopefully our high school students will as well and we'll see you on um, your call to, to get involved. So thank you so much again for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. And with that, I will turn it over to Michelle to close us out. Wow, <laughs> this was a, such an interesting evening. And thank you, Delegate Tran, for telling us about your unique experience when you were new to America. Um, and we enjoyed hearing about your early focus on social justice and mission-directed work. Also, thanks for explaining about the training programs that can help folks determine if they're on the path to running for office and how that gave you your jumpstart to becoming a candidate and a delegate. 
I especially appreciated your advice to students about how to become engaged in public service all the ways, just from calling to ask of questions to getting involved in a campaign, internships, um, all the options that you um, made available. We've heard this word a couple times this evening, but your work is just inspirational and impactful. Now I'm going to get foggy, and we're so glad that you joined us. Um, some reminders for our listeners, check out our social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, our websites, email us at info at lewisacademynow.org and email the TJ Alumni Action Group at info at tjaag.org. Um, our next speaker will be Congressman Jerry Connolly on Thursday, May 20th. Until then, go in peace, ring the bells of liberty, love yourself, and make good trouble. Good night, everyone. <laughs>